Welcome back. In this section, we're going to look at limits again, this time not using delta epsilon definition of limits to do our calculations. Uh, we want to do things a little bit more efficiently, and fortunately there are some theorems here to help us out. Uh, so we're going to start off with some theorems that look pretty basic, but then we'll combine them to get more exciting things. Um, starting with the first few theorems, these are not terribly surprising. If you have a constant function, y equals b, and you're looking for a limit, that limit is b. And that's probably not a surprise. If your y values are always b, then no matter what x is approaching, then the y value should approach b. Um, same thing with Point number two, this is also not terribly surprising. If you had y equals x, that's your function, and you're looking for x to approach c, then what's the limit for x? Probably not a big surprise that it's c. Um, and actually, for x to a power, it's just c to a power for our limit. Now, we have a second theorem that allows us to look at uh, combinations of functions where limits exist. Uh, so here we've got two functions, f and g, and their limits are existing. So we know that f has a limit and so does g, and they have that limit existing as x goes to c. Uh, so this theorem is telling you that if you are going to add those two functions and you want to look for a limit, that limit will exist, and you'll get it by taking the two limits and adding them together or subtracting them. Or if you want to multiply the two functions and then look for the limit, well, that's just the two limits for the two functions multiplied together. And same thing for a quotient. It's just the quotient of the two limits, provided that the, the limit is not zero. Um, and that for a function raised to a power, it would just be the that limit for that function raised to that power. Uh, and of course, constant multiples of functions are just the limit times that constant multiple. And so if we put that all together, then that means it's going to be a little bit easier for us to now find limits. Um, I'm going to do a couple of examples, and I'm going to do a lot more writing than I probably will do for limits afterwards. So please bear with me for the following examples. For the first one, uh, I want to find a limit for this little polynomial, and I want to find the limit as x goes to 1. Uh, I'm going to do, like I said, way more writing than I normally would, but I really just sort of want to justify all of my steps here. So the first thing that I know is by my theorem that the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared should be 1 squared, which is 1. That's my first fact. Um, and since the limit for x squared exists, then the limit for a constant times x squared should exist. So the limit as x goes to 1 of 4x squared should be 4 times the limit as x goes to 1 of x squared, which is 4 times 1, which is 4. So I've, I figured out the limit for the first term. Similarly, I know for the second term that the limit as x goes to 1 of x is 1. And so that the limit as x goes to 1 of 3x is 3 times the limit as x goes to 1 of x, which is 3 times 1, or 3. And for the third term, I have that the limit as x goes to 1 of 1, that's just a constant function, well, that's just itself. So I figured out the limit for the first term, for the second term, for the third term. All three terms, their limits exist. So the sums and differences of those three terms, its limit should exist. So now I can finally conclude that if I were looking for the limit as x goes to 1 of 4x squared minus 3x plus 1, that that's the limit as x goes to 1 of 4x squared, which we figured out minus the limit as x goes to 1 of 3x, which we figured out, plus the limit as x goes to 1 of 1, which we figured out uh, were 4, 3, and 1, respectively. So we wind up getting our limit is just 2. Um, I'm going to just sort of 
pause here for a moment and point out the obvious that the 2 that we get is exactly the same value we would get if we put in 1 for x just at the very beginning. And in fact, that's essentially what we're winding up doing. Uh, so we are essentially finding the limit here by direct substitution. And we're going to have a theorem that comes up in just a moment to justify that for us. Um, I'm going to do one more example again with probably a little bit too much writing. So here I'm looking for the limit as x goes to 1 of 3x minus 1 over x plus 2. Um, so I'm going to start with my numerator. So number 1, the limit x goes to 1 of x is 1. And so that means the limit as x goes to 1 of 3x should be 3 times the limit as x goes to 1 of 1. So we get 3. Um, I know that the numerator has got two terms, 3x minus 1, and I know that the limit as x goes to 1 of 1 is 1. So putting it together for my whole numerator, the limit as x goes to 1 of 3x minus 1 is the limit for the 3x minus the limit for the 1, which is 3 minus 1 or 2. So I've done my numerator. Good. Next for my denominator, I know the limit as x goes to 1 of x is 1. I know the limit as x goes to 1 of 2 is 2. And so for my denominator, the limit as x goes to 1 of x plus 2 is the two limits added together, which is 1 plus 2 or 3. And I make a little side note here that that limit is definitely not 0. So the limit exists for the top, and it's 2. The limit exists for the bottom, and it's 3, which is, happens to not be 0. So if we're looking for now the limit as x goes to 1 of this rational function, that's the limit as x goes to 1 for the top, divided by limit x goes to 1 for the bottom. And that would be our quotient of our limits, 2 and 3, or 2 thirds. Now, again, as I said, I have done much more writing here than I will normally do for these limit-finding problems, and we're going to have some theorems that will justify why I can get away with doing a lot less writing in the future. But again, I want us to notice here, just before we leave this problem, uh, that the two-thirds that I get is essentially the value that you get by directly substituting in 1 for x into the numerator and the denominator. And so now here's our theorem that tells us why what we did works, which is for rational functions and polynomials. So if P and Q, if they happen to be polynomials, um, C is any real number. So if you're looking at just a polynomial function itself and you're looking for any limit, that's found just by evaluating your function. So that justifies the, the little thing that we noticed, which is that our limit turned out to be the same thing as what we got just by putting in that value for x. And the same thing is true for rational functions. If you have a polynomial over a polynomial and you're looking for a limit as x goes to some number c, well, that's just the quotient that you'd get by evaluating the top and the bottom at C as long as the denominator is not zero. In other words, for polynomials and for rational functions, we just have to use direct substitution. So uh, that means for something like a rational function or a polynomial, it's a lot less work from here on out. So, for example, uh, I'm looking at this, and I can see for this function, it's made out of two things. I can see it's made out of a polynomial, and I know it's made out of a rational function. So I'm going to do the two parts separately, and then I'm going to combine them together to get that whole limit. So I'll start off with first making a little note that for the polynomial part, the limit that x goes to 2 of our polynomial should just be found by direct substitution. Putting in 2 uh, for x
So I have 2 squared plus 2 times 2 minus 1, which is 7. So that's my, my polynomial, happens to be 7. For the rational function, uh, for a rational function, we can do direct substitution as long as the denominator is not 0. And if I look at the denominator, I would see, well, if I put in 2 for x, it wouldn't give me 0. So we're good to go on the, on the rational function, and I can use direct substitution for that as well. So x squared plus 1 over x minus 1, as x goes to 2, I can just directly substitute. So that second term is 5. And now I can say, well, previous theorem said if you had two functions whose limit existed and you looked at their sum, then you could find the limit of that sum by adding those two limits together. Um, so in other words, if we're looking for the limit as x goes to 2 of all of this, x squared plus 3x minus 1 plus rational function, that I could do that by finding the limit for the polynomial plus the limit for the rational function. And of course, I have already done that, so I can just jump right ahead and say that my answer should be 7 plus 5 or 12. Um, so, again, I, I did probably a little bit more writing here than you normally would. Uh, so, at this point, I probably would have just jumped ahead and said the answer is 12. I mean, the splitting it into two separate limits. I'm doing that to be a little bit precise here. Um, but, again, there's, there's not really a, a huge need to. So, if I looked at this and I saw this problem again, I would say, well, I have a polynomial plus a rational function. So, that limit definitely will exist. This one I check to see if its denominator is not zero. That definitely exists. Okay, great. Everybody has a limit. I'll just directly substitute. That's normally how I'll tackle these problems in the future.